What's up, everybody? This is Shanti Das, and I just want to let you know that life is a journey, not a destination. Enjoy the 411 session. You know what time it is? It's time for the 411 session. I'm Ariel Boyd. And the 411 session is where we bring the big world of entertainment to students like us. Without further ado, I want to bring you the beautiful, the music mogul and the entertainment mogul, Shanti Dives. Pleasure being able to give back and share my story, and uh, 411 definitely helped a lot of the artists that I worked with. We will get into that uh, early on in my career, so it's an honor to be here talking to you guys today. So, I'm Shanti Dots. I'm originally from Atlanta, Georgia. I went to Benjamin Mays High School and graduated in 1989 and uh, decided to go to school up north. Um, I went to Syracuse University and majored in television, radio, and film, but I always I kind of knew what I was passionate about, and I knew that I loved music early on. Back in the day, from the days of growing up watching Soul Train or American Bandstand, shout out to Dick Clark, who just passed away, um, but was a big part of my childhood because he just, you know, he did such a great job in terms of integrating the music that we saw on television and kind of breaking down some of the racial barriers um, for African Americans to actually be seen on a national level. So I just love watching music videos or, you know, listening to music. And we had cassettes back then. You know, so I had every cassette, every imaginable, ever imaginable. And I just started trying to volunteer and get out and meet people at an early age. Um, I talk to people a lot about networking, and you're never too young to start networking. So I started to network within my own family and my own community, if you will. And uh, one of my sister's friends was a program director at uh, B103, the radio station. And so when I was in like the ninth grade, he would let me come up and uh, work uh, in the booth with him, and I would kind of arrange some of the tapes and so forth. But I did that as much as I could on a volunteer basis, and so I just was so kind of in awe of what happened at a radio station, and because I already love music, I was like, this is kind of cool, so let me see if I can learn more about this as a career for me, possibly. So I um, did that for a couple years, and then once I attended Syracuse University, I wasn't quite sure what I wanted to major in. And Sometimes students are always hard on themselves because they feel like they just need to figure everything out their freshman year. And so, although it's great when you kind of know what you want to do, you know, early on, just need to take the time and start getting involved in as many activities as possible. Find out really what your passions are, where your likes are. And that's just what I did. I started giving campus tours because I knew I liked to talk and I liked, you know, to meet new people. So, my sophomore year, I gave tours to the incoming freshmen. And then I started getting involved in the radio station. I was like, well, if I shadow this guy in Atlanta, maybe there's a station here that I can work at. So we had a little college radio station called the 89. Started volunteering there and then actually started um, working more at the station in the promotions department. And then they voted me assistant promotions director. So I was involved in a lot of campus activities with the radio station. And then I thought, well, it might be cool to see if I could do the on-air thing. So I you know, put a little tape together and uh, audition uh, to be on air, and I made it, but I was going from like 2 to 4 in the morning, it was a great yard shift, but I knew it was an opportunity for me, so I kind of took it and ran with it. Then the next year, that turned into a different role for me, I had a good friend who had a hip-hop show on Saturday nights, and I started doing like the entertainment segment, so uh, that was really fun for me, and so I was calling radio stations and getting them to send us music and we could play it on the show trying to find out what the dirt was. And back then, we didn't have reality shows and all the sites like Bossup and YPF to give you all the latest celebrity gossip information or TMZ. So I got to kind of do my own digging and read all the magazines like Write On and Ebony and Jet, anything and everything that I could get my hands on that was related to entertainment. That's what I did. And so I kind of like became this little entertainment chick on campus. People always knew that I had my hands on the pulse of whatever, whatever was going on with music. We also had a newsletter called The Happenings. And so, again, I would you know, write to um, record companies, get them to send us their new CDs that were about to be released, and I would write up you know, different articles and reviews. And so I did that for a couple of years. And so I just tried to get involved, like I said, in anything and everything I could on campus. 
And being from Atlanta, I it was a good time for me because I, I was at Syracuse between 89 and 93. And like the early 90s was really when Atlanta was starting to pop on the music scene. And the LA Babyface had moved to town and they were setting up shop. All the other major companies had offices here. They had what we call sales branches. And so it was a really good opportunity there. And so I started saving my money instead of like shopping and taking, you know, spring break trips to Daytona Beach or wherever was the hot spot. I saved my money so that I could attend these conventions. So I went to conventions like Jack the Rapper, MVPC, Impact. Those were all conventions that were popular back then. And so I was just going up to people and trying to network and, you know, I wasn't shy. I would go into the seminars and if I had a question, I'd raise my hand. And I know a lot of my friends, they were too afraid. And, and so I tell people, what's the worst that somebody can say to say no, or they won't answer the question the way you want it to be answered. But at least you did your cheat, you know, you did your thing in terms of trying to ask a question and, and get back some great information that you can use later on. So I was this little girl that was kind of bopping all around the conference, walking up to Russell Simmons, like, you don't know me, but by the end of the convention, you will. And he looked at me like, who is this little girl? And why are you in my face? No, but he was, he was halfway nice, and he was just like, oh, okay. But sure enough, by the end of the conference, I went back up to him and he was like, yo, I've seen you doing your thing. You were like at this showcase, you were at this panel. He was like, I'm really like impressed. So that was like, for me, it was like winning a million dollars. That Russell Simmons actually remembered me and kind of saw me hustling, trying to, you know, get my network going. So that just gave me that much more encouragement that I was definitely on the right track to where I needed to be. So my sophomore year, um, I came back home after the summer, and I mean during the summer rather, and I got a job at Capitol Records. It's all about who you know, right? A little bit of that, and some of what you know. But contacts are always key, so make sure that you do the best job you can in terms of trying to build a really great Rolodex. So the um, young lady that I knew worked at Capitol Records. I knew her through a friend of a family. She was going on maternity leave, and they needed somebody to replace her for the summer. I was like, well, I'll do it. <laughs> I'm trying to get an internship. I'm back home in Atlanta. I didn't really want to go to New York or LA. And funny thing is, I had applied for an internship for the Arsenio Hall show. I don't even know how, how many of you have heard of it. <laughs> you all probably very young and came on back in the day. But it was a late night um, talk show that featured live music. And I had actually won the opportunity to intern out there in LA. But they didn't offer any money. They didn't offer housing. And they had any family out there. But I just really wanted to make it happen. But my mom was like, no way, no how. You're not going to California. So I thought like my world was like crushed. And so I called this young lady that I knew at Capitol and I was like, my mom's not like me in time. I'm so frustrated, but I really want to get something in music. But I just didn't want to just sit home and waste that time all summer by sitting idle when I had all this energy, you know, thought that I could be working in the career um, that I wanted to work in. So she gave me the shot and I did that for three months and then went back to school and kind of re-energized and you know it was cool because people already thought I was working in the music industry and I continued to go to conferences and so they welcomed me back the next summer after my junior year. So I did that for another three months. Went back to Syracuse, stayed on the radio there, kept writing for the happenings. Um, I even wanted to pledge and uh, I went through like six months of like a lot of underground craziness but then the line got in trouble. And then by the time they were actually able to have Rush, I had the opportunity to attend like a really, really big convention on the music side. And so I ended up not pledging. I kind of sacrificed all of that. And I was like, you know what? This is great, but I already know who I am. I wanted to do this because I would like what y'all represent, but I didn't need those young ladies to make me whole. Because um, sometimes some people pledge for various reasons, and I'm not knocking that, but for me, I was really going after my career. And so I didn't let anything cloud my judgment of that. So ended up going to the conference, made, you know, even more contacts. And uh, by the time I senior year rolled around, you know, I was trying to figure out, okay, what am I going to do? I was sending out resumes. But I knew the music industry wasn't quite the same as, like, if you were trying to apply for an accounting job or you thought about going to law school. It wasn't, like, just an easy blueprint, <laughs> so to speak, like other careers are, where you know if you go and do four years, you can apply for this job. And that position, you know, will nine times out of ten be open. So the music industry is more about who you knew, you know, your connections and that sort of thing. So I just started reaching back out and trying to touch everybody that I had touched throughout my college year. And so I ended up talking back to the gentleman that hired me initially at Capitol Records. 
he had just recently left Capital and started consulting for LA Babyface. That's why it's so important whenever you have an opportunity with people, even if it doesn't end up being what you want it to be, never burn bridges. You know, always just be grateful for that opportunity and take the high road because you never know who can end up helping you in the long run. So that same guy said that LaFace was looking to hire somebody in promotions. And so I thought, oh my God, this is in Atlanta. You know, I don't have to move to New York or LA. Let me see if I can at least get in for an interview. Okay, so I gotta tell you something funny though. So that summer, in between uh, graduating and starting at the record company, I went to see one of my best friends who was in school in DC. And they had this concert called the Budweiser Superfest. So Pebbles at the time was performing and she was married to L.A. Reid, you know, who's now an X Factor, was president of uh, Def Jam, and now over Sony. So L.A. Reid was really popular back then. He used, used to be in this group called The Deal. So everybody knew who he was. So I'm in the airport, this little short girl, with all this luggage, because I never know how to pack lightly, even back then. So I'm standing in line, waiting, my luggage is coming around the carousel. So this is guy standing there. And so it was so many people, it was crowded, it was a lot of bags in the carousel. And I was like, I just tapped him on the shoulder. I was like, get my bags. And he kind of turned around and looked at me. And I was like, yo, you let, I was like, I can't see. It's too many people. Can you get my bags, please? <laughs> so he looked at me kind of crazy again. And so then he's like, I guess I got to talk with So he gave me my two bags. And so I was like, thank you very much. And I proceeded to walk on my knee. Back then, we didn't have cell phones. So I had to go to the pay phone, call my homegirl, tell her I was in town, and then I was even going to take a taxi or she could come pick me up. Next thing I know, this guy comes around the corner was like, oh, this Louis Vuitton luggage, like, four sky caps, like, walking him out. And I'm like, oh, my God, who did I just ask to give me my luggage? I was so embarrassed and so freaked out. It was L.A. Reed. <laughs> was, I just, like, could have crawled under a box somewhere. But long story short, so when I got to interview him, he remembered me. <laughs> I was so embarrassed. I was like, what are the odds if we run into this guy and this be the same man? So I wasn't rude, but it was just a funny story. He jokes about it to this day. I was telling him, yeah, she makes me get her luggage. <laughs> so anyway, long story short, I interviewed with LA, and uh, you know, thankfully I was able to land a job. I started in 1993. I think it was August of 1993. And I hit the road running. Tony Braxton had just put out her album. She was on tour with Frank Rivera and May, so they needed somebody to go out. And so what I was doing while I was on tour with Tony is I was responsible for setting up her meeting greets. And a meeting greet basically is just, just that. It's where fans get to meet Tony, people from the radio stations, the program directors, the music directors, they would come, they would have to take pictures with her. So I had to say we were at Phillips Arena. I would have to go to Phillips Arena, find um, the best location backstage, whichever green room or room that we were going to be in, make sure we had like food and beverages for our guests, make sure the photographer was there, and kind of like, you know, get people in and out, make sure everyone was in line, waiting nicely, you know, all the phone rushing told me, being disrespectful. So I had to facilitate all of that on tour, but it was like a dream come true. I mean, I'm four months out of college, and I'm on the road with Tony Braxton. Then I started working with Outkast. The first song we worked with Players Ball, which a lot of people don't realize, but that song was actually from our Christmas album um, that we put out that year. And then it ended up you know, being a part of their debut album, which was Southern Playlist and Capital Music. The album ended up going platinum, so that was my first project that I, I can definitely say I worked and really kind of was instrumental in, in breaking them in the South. Um, you know, it was a interesting time in hip hop because that's when like New York was still really on top and the West Coast, you know, was um, really growing like with some dog and Dre and those guys. And so I was at the Source Awards in ninety five and Outcast on the best new rap group. It was me, Dre and Big and it was so funny because people were just so disrespectful. <laughs> no, it, it's really true. Like the South did get a lot of respect when it came to hip hop. And so we used to go to New York and it was so tough trying to break New York and hip hop. And all the DJs from Front Master Flex and you know, DJ Enough and all those guys on down eventually started playing us. But we had to play like hole in the wall clubs and really, really try to convince these people, you know, that we tired. I will say this much, um, Diddy, who was back then Puff Daddy, um, did a lot of work with Blue Face Records and he and LA Green were tight. So he really supported Outcast early on and was instrumental in helping us, you know, open more doors in New York City. So that was a fun time for me. Um, I was just looking at uh, a chili um, when I came in, and it's so funny because I asked John, I was like, what was that interview taking? I swear that girl does not age. I thought it was something that was done like,
many, many years ago, but I had the good fortune of working with TLC. I got to go on tour with them. I'm still good friends with both of them to this day, and Miss Lisa terribly and he left out, you know, so I walked with us. But I went on tour with them, same thing, set up meet and greets. And so I did promotions. Oh, I'm leaving out the other big artist, Usher. I hit the road with Usher. Uh, we did probably every hole in the wall club there was. And so it's funny because when I deal with some artists, because I still do um, marketing now, and we'll get into that later, but some of the artists now have this sense of entitlement, and they just really only want to be in hot spots and only want to do what's popping or you know what's already hot. But I'm like, you know, you got to humble yourself a little bit. And there's something to say about putting in the hard work and effort that it takes to really get your brand out there. And you know, back then, nobody knew Usher, and he was like, they're gonna know me. And so we would go and do clubs that had 50 people, or clubs that had 500 people, you know? And then, of course, once his music started growing and gaining popularity, then more people started showing up, showing up to the shows. But my point is, there's something to say about hard work, you know, and, and really putting that effort forth. Um, and not just expecting everything to kind of happen overnight. You know, we live in this, reality show, YouTube overnight sensation type of uh, society now and community. And so I just really want to let you guys know whether you're aspiring to be an artist or an executive in the entertainment business, just don't be afraid to roll your sleeves up and work really hard. Like, don't expect anybody to give you anything. Um, I worked my butt off to get to where I am. And for that, you know, and I'm very humble and grateful about it. I still have a wonderful relationship with most of the people in the business, and I can call on these people when I need them. So just, you know, if you're really passionate about it and hungry, don't be afraid to put the work in. So um, going back to what I was saying earlier about doing promotions, after I worked with all those artists, and I think the last two projects I worked with Goody Mom, which was you know, incredible, and I'm so proud to see her see what right now, but I got to work with him. He was really, you know, on the hip hop scene, and Donnell Jones. So I did that till about 96, maybe early 97, and I kind of wanted to go in a different direction. So I started doing marketing with some of those same projects, and then I got to work with uh, Tony Braxton again, but on the marketing side. So I worked at LaFace from 93 to 2000, and then LA Babyface, <coughs> excuse me, decided to sell the company. Well, great for them. You know, they were able to sell their company, make a lot of money, and move on. But for those of us, more people on the totem pole, we had to kind of figure out what was next for us. So LA moved to New York to replace Clyde Davis, who at the time uh, was the president of Arista Records, and Clyde Davis actually started Arista Records. So I wasn't quite sure if I wanted to move to New York, and especially being from the South, I just, it's all these, you know, it's scary, you know, it's all these things that go, you know, swirl around in your head, like, should I move, is it the right thing, I can I even make it in New York? Because um, I had insecurities, um, growing up, but I just try not to let it get the best of me. And so I always try to talk to different people, and that's why it's important to have good mentors in your life. You, you know, your sister can be a mentor, a neighbor, or a church member. You know, it doesn't always necessarily have to be someone that's in that field, but you just need good people that you can call on to give you really good advice. So I talked to several people, and, um, you know, at that time, you know, I was, you know, still really young. I was just about to turn 30, and so I didn't have kids. I wasn't married. And so everybody's like, just go for it. You know, it's the worst that can happen. You go there, it doesn't work out, you can move back home to it. So decided to move to LA, I mean to New York, and I went to Arista Records with LA. But this is interesting. And women in particular, let me just tell you, be careful how you negotiate your terms. Um, and especially once you start getting to a certain level, because by that time I was at the senior director level. You can't just let anybody throw you throw out any offer to you and you accept it. You need to do your research and make sure it's the right opportunity and it's the right salary for you. So long story short, um, I ended up having an interview with two other people at two other companies because LA offered me the same salary that I was working in, making in Atlanta. And I thought, how am I going to live off of this in New York? Because as everyone knows, the cost of living is so much higher in New York. So. I had a couple friends that were already working in New York and they introduced me to some other folks at some other labels. And so it was, you know, somewhat of a negotiating um, tactic that I used. And LA was then like, oh, you can't go work for them. And so now we could actually play. You know, we could play ball, we could negotiate, and we could talk. So I ended up eventually going with LA and he doubled the salary offer because I actually went and got those other um, interviews for myself. So 
make sure you know what you're getting into. And don't always take, you know, don't always say yes. You know, do the research and make sure it's the best opportunity for you. So I went to Ariston, stayed there for about a year and a half. And, you know, then, you know, by this time, you know, LA's at a company working for someone. It wasn't his own company. And he had a boss. So I didn't want to run to him every time I had an issue. Because I just, I just, I'm not the type of person, you know, one, I like to try to figure things out as best as I can. But this guy that I was reporting to was really mean. He was a yeller. He was, it was just a very different experience from what I was used to. And granted, in the entertainment industry, sometimes, you know, tensions rise. It is a different, you know, sort of industry. And I do have thick skin, but I know it takes so much. I'm human, right? <laughs> so it got really, really bad. And so I decided to quit. I've never quit anything in my life. And it was a very difficult time for me, pretty much a low point in my career. And I came back home for the summer. And so you gotta remember, when I was at LaFace, I, I just bought a house, and I sold it when I moved to New York. So I basically didn't have anything to come back to. I could've come back and moved into my mom's house, but I didn't want to do that. I came to one summer out, and I'll come back and try to help out at home, but I don't want to have to go back and the up my hands. So I kinda hung out on my friend's couch for the whole summer, and, um, Going back to keeping those relationships alive, you know, I actually grew up and uh, moved to Maine pre at a very young age. I was first working with Chris Cross and those guys. So I talked to JD and a couple other people while I was home that summer, and um, Jermaine suggested that I come back to New York and interview at Columbia Records. And at the time, his social death label was distributed through some music in Columbia Records. So Jermaine got me an interview with Donnie Iron, who was the chairman at the time, and I got hired as vice president. And that was another thing when I was at Arista, I felt like, okay, I'm the senior director. Why am I not up for any vice president positions? And I felt like I had kind of proven myself and worked and helped break all of these other acts, but I saw all these other people around me getting opportunities. And so sometimes when you're in a situation, you just got to kind of weigh your options and see whether it makes sense to stick it out or not. So for me, again, it didn't make sense to stick it out. And so I ended up getting hired as vice president of urban marketing at Columbia. And I stayed there for six months, and then they offered me the entire department. So although they brought me in as a vice president, I didn't have anyone reporting to me. So after six months, they um, asked me if I wanted to take on the staff. So I had four product managers that started reporting to me. And uh, I was there for four years. Then I got another promotion in two years to senior director of marketing. I got to work with my favorite artist of all time, which is Prince. Great, great story. Um, and I'm the type of person where I feel like um, we all, you know, wake up, brush our teeth the same. We're pretty much regular. Like, I don't, I look up to people, but I don't just put them up on a pedestal so much where I feel like they're just on a different level and I can't really interact with them. And all the artists, I never really got jaded with, you know, all the successful artists that I ever worked with. But I really bugged out <laughs> the first time I met Prince. That was the only time I felt like, okay, I'm so embarrassed. I can't figure this one out. So my boss knew I was a big Prince fan. So he called me up to his office and his assistant was like, get out your nail. And I'm like, oh my God, what have I done? And I was like, they're going to fire me. Something crazy is happening. There's all these things going on in my head. And so I get upstairs. His assistant's like, hurry, hurry. I get to the door. The door opens. It's just Prince and my boss in the office. So my boss is like standing in the background. And Prince comes and opens the door. I froze. For the first time in my life, I had nothing to say. I, I was staring at him like an idiot. And my boss was in the background. I got you. And I was like, oh my God, I'm going to kill him. So, so I walked in, and at the time, he had this video called Musicology. And that was the album that he was working in. So I had the good for great fortune of going on tour with Prince. I did about 12 or 13 days. And uh, just kind of everything he needed on the road, anytime. He didn't do many meeting groups, but you know, I was kind of like assisting you know, any of his efforts. Like we did a couple photo shoots, and it's funny, he was really big in the internet back then, and so he would always be like, let me show you this. He would hate when it was a picture online that he didn't like, and he would make me go figure out how I could get the picture kept me down, and have to call the site and all that. But it was, it was a real pleasure working with him, and I was probably the one time that I felt like a kid, and I couldn't really just compose myself, but uh, that was a great experience. And I also worked with um, Mike Jennings, soul singer. Uh, Vivian Green, who hasn't put out anything lately, but still an amazing artist. Uh, Nas, John Legend at the time was new to the label and got a chance to be a part of that project indirectly. Um, so it was just a wonderful time for me. And then it was time for me to re renegotiate my contract again. And so, same thing, women. You know, 
I hate to keep going back to that. That doesn't. I'm not really trying to um, not give the guys any good advice um, because you just need a good attorney once you get to that level in your career because it's about all about negotiating with the right people. And so I ended up having to go get a very expensive attorney. But this was a guy that dealt with the label on a regular basis. And if you you got to start negotiating high because they're always going to lowball you. So if you start high, they are going to lowball you, and hopefully you can be somewhere in the middle. You know that's going to work for both of you guys. And so I got myself a great attorney, and, and I ended up um, talking to the folks over where I was at Sony. They wanted me to stay, but it, I kind of felt myself out growing that system as well. And sometimes there's something to say about being at a company for 20 years, but I don't think that happens as much as it used to, um, especially with the way the climate is right now. So I got an offer from Sylvia Rome, um, who was at the time president of Universal Motown. I went over to talk to her and then ended up working it out with her, and I got hired as executive vice president of Urban Marketing. While there, I was working with Erica Badu, Buster Rhymes, Shanti, which was so crazy because we'd be in meetings and they'd be like, Shanti, Shanti, Shanti. I'm like, <laughs> that was always a running joke because we never could figure out who was asking the question because people call me Sean to even that's in my day. Um, so that was a great experience and I got two words. Um, another big icon, Stevie Wonder, put out a DVD. So it wasn't like working his music project, but he released a DVD and that was really cool. So I got to go to a couple planning meetings with him. Um, it's just been, I've had an amazing run, but I don't take any of that for granted. Um, so after four years, four and a half years of being at University of Motown, I just felt like I needed to do something different in my life because for almost 20 years, I had this great career, but I sacrificed a lot. And so you got to know that if you want these great positions, there's going to be a lot of sacrifice. You have to be willing to put up with that and know how much of it you can really take and how much you can handle it. So for me, I never really had that baby itch or I wanted to be married. Um, but it, it didn't matter. Now it's a funny thing, cause, and I'll get to this too. My mom has Alzheimer's now, so she doesn't really remember a lot. Um, and I just feel like I missed out on a lot of good news and her crying was too, right? So I went to see my mom a couple weeks ago, and she's like, Shanti, did you ever get married? I'm like, no, mom, not yet. She said, well, you know it's not too late. And I said, yeah, mom, you don't want to work on that. <laughs> she asked me that like five times. Did you know that? I don't really remember what you're saying. So anyway, now I'm kind of sitting back now reflecting on that kind of stuff going, wow, okay, I am 41 years old and we figured this whole thing called life out right now. So at the end of 2009, I did some, well, actually, during that entire year while I was still in Motown, several things happened. Um, my mom started getting a early dementia. My uncle died, who was kind of like my dad. And then I experienced some health issues and I just, it didn't feel right going to work every day. Although I had achieved a lot of the success it was time for me to press my reset button. So I took a leap of faith. I quit. Sylvia was very supportive. It's not always easy to walk out of a situation. But it's always about how you handle yourself and how you treat people. And if you treat people right at the end of the day, nine times out of ten, and if you handle your business, they're going to want to help you. So I had a lot of people who assisted me during my transition. So I moved back home to Atlanta. I still knew Atlanta was somewhat of a hotbed in the entertainment industry, you know, especially with a lot of films being shot here and a lot of television shows being shot here. So I was like, okay, I'm going to go back and start my own company. So that was kind of like cut to scene two of, of my life. And so now I have my own company called Press Reset Entertainment. I feel like the Jamaican, and I'm sure you know, you know, business, you, you're everything. You're the assistant. <laughs> you're the printer because you got to get all that done. You're the accountant. If I send my invoices out, I don't get paid. You know, you do everything. You have to wear so many hats. And everybody think it's so sexy to say, oh, I'm an entrepreneur. And it sounds great, but it's a lot of work, let me tell you. So just know that if you ever want to be an entrepreneur, you know, do your homework first and, and have people on the side that you can call on and, and just really plan it out without just kind of jumping in head first because it can be a little bit overwhelming. So I came back home at the end of 2000. And I did some philanthropy type work. Um, and then I started doing some marketing. I started a showcase here that's kind of, I think, a staple in the community now. It's called ATL Live on the Park. We do it once a month. Um, we're in our third season, so that's going well. I also, um, like I said, I still do marketing for some of the artists. I think the homeless once a month. Uh, I'm now a radio co-host, so that, that uh, degree that I got from Syracuse and television radio is finally coming in hand now. Uh, last year, I had the pleasure of meeting Chris Weber, 
who's a former NBA player. Now he's on NBA TV and sometimes on TNT. He came to my showcase and uh, again, going back to how you treat people, because life lessons can help you in your career too. He came and I was very attentive to he and his wife. I wasn't just, oh, oh Chris, 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 he's this cute guy who's at my showcase. No, I was respectful to him, his wife. I kept checking back on, you know, with them, making sure they needed anything. And so just that little bit of courtesy, you know, that I showed to them came back um, to help me. And so he offered me the opportunity to be his co host. did his research, he found out about my background in music, and he he wanted to have someone that had a lot of experience on the music side. And so it's a sports and music talk show here on Foxhole, which is Jamie Fox's station. So I do that twice a week. Um, oh, I get my props. I'm also the author of two books. So in two years, I've self-published two books. The first one is called The Hip Hop Professional. It's a woman's guide to climbing the ladder of success in the entertainment business. And I really just talk about, you know, what I did as a woman to make it, the good and the bad and the ugly. Um, but I kind of give it to you straight. And I think it's a book, though, that can help women and men, and I'll kind of pass that around. My second book is The One, Two, Threes of Networking. And it's just a little pocket guide of networking tips. And I wish that I had kind of had this growing up because I felt like sometimes I wasn't quite sure what, what questions to ask or if I should even approach people in these sort of settings. You know, should I be afraid? Or, Again, go back to what's the worst that can happen, you know. And so I talk to students now about the importance of networking, and so I'll pass that around. But it's been an amazing experience for me, and also humbling. You know, the industry is different um, in a good and bad way. You know, sometimes you feel like, okay, I'm this executive vice president on top of the world. But when you leave that corner office, and sometimes, you know, you go back home and you start your own business, you'll be surprised the people you can and can't get on. And so it's still always a hustle and a constant grind for me as an entrepreneur now. But going back to trying to keep those solid relationships, and I always just try to keep in touch with people, even if I email them once a month or call them every now and then, just so I can stay top of mind. Um, even when I was at Motown, we kind of experienced a, a time at the label where we didn't put out a lot of releases. So I felt like, okay, wow, we back. Like, you know, I have product out. <laughs> cold on the streets, nothing's really happening. How can I keep my brand alive? Because it's important, even though I was an executive, I'm not an artist, I'm still a brand. Kevin Lyles, who's a, you know, is now a manager in the business, but was the president of Def Jam for many years, taught me early on to market myself as a brand. He said, you know, you're not Shanti from the face, you're Shanti Das. And I had to understand, and I, he told me that, he was like, I'm not trying to say be cocky about it, but just understand your value. And so I was like, okay, you know, let me make sure I'm keeping my brand alive. So I was um, out and about in New York City, and I was like, what can I do, even though things are kind of cold for us right now in Motown, to keep me hot in the marketplace right now? And so I partnered up with a couple guys. There was no showcase going on in New York where artists could, you know, showcase their material for consumers and for record company executives. So, ended up starting um, a showcase called Army Live. We found a great venue. And the other thing, when you're starting out on a venture, I think one of the key components in doing something great is finding that void in the marketplace and then doing it really well. So because there was nowhere where you could go, we wanted to make, make it the best experience ever. So we got a really, really great venue in the middle of Times Square. And we just had a live band, so you could come, you know, gig, play a couple, three or four songs, you know. But we had everybody from the likes of L.A. Reed, Jay-Z, I remember one night, my girl comes, she's like, oh my God, go to the back door right now, Denzel's coming. I go to let Denzel in, take it to the back. And, I mean, we had all these people at our showcase. It was the hottest event in New York for two years. Going back to finding the boy in the marketplace, offering a quality product for an event, and doing it right, and being respectful, and just making people feel comfortable so they want to come back. So that kept me alive, and so that was kind of one of the reasons why, <coughs> excuse me, I started my showcase when I moved back down to Atlanta, just from having that experience in New York. So that's kind of like me and my journey. I know that's probably been a lot, <laughs> but I just wanted you to really know my background, but I do want you guys to be able to, you know, interact with me and ask questions. Y'all or anything, but um, I can talk about it. You know, I'm, I'm not embarrassed by anything. I think you know our 
experiences in life and our scars help shape us. And my father committed suicide when I was seven months old. And uh, my sister, who was nine years older than me, had to pay away from college and just, you know, overcame all these obstacles in her life because my mom leaned on her a lot after my dad left us um, that way, that unfortunate way. And so just looking at her, I was like, my sister can do it. I'm not just going to sit here and have this pity party. You know, I'm going to go and be the best person that I can and go after my dreams and goals and try to come back and help my mom. Remember, got to put your brand out there. All right, you know, I want to have the rest of school. You know, my partner, he's in the chairs or something. I'm going to have to And what do you guys do? I'm a rapper. Oh, okay, cool. Okay. I have to have a I'll take it. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. And, um, I'm on the internet right now, rolling out.com. That's, that's how I found out. And rolling out? Yes. Oh, cool. I do a lot of stuff with them. Yeah, that's how I found out about Randy Sidney in the in the um, talking about the session. Nice. And um, you named like two of my favorite rappers, Nas and Outkast. Like, who would you like to be like, interacting with Nas? And, you know, Funny thing you say that. I just interviewed Nas today. Why? Um, he called into the Chris Webber show, which was an amazing experience to be able to talk to him because I haven't seen him in a while. Um, it was incredible uh, working with Nas. Um, and although I wasn't the product manager that did his day to day, I kind of oversaw the entire campaign and I would go, you know, some video shoots and that sort of thing. He was just always just a real dude, and that's what I respected. You always knew what you were getting with Nas. Like, you can try to be anyone he wasn't. And he was always super creative, you know, in the studio. It wasn't just about coming up with, you know, what was hot for the moment. Because Nas is a real lyricist. And I think that's something, you know, about when you talk about Andre 3000. Those guys are real lyricists. And so I felt like they, not that other artists don't, but their respect for the craft is like no other. Because, you know, Nas might go, you know, several years in between, but he's not just gonna come throw some BS out there. And so he's just probably one of the most deep artists that I ever worked with. And Outkast, I mean, they were great. Um, it's funny because early on, remember Dre wasn't dressing the way he kind of is now? And so Dre was wearing like white t-shirt and the jeans and I think by, was it the Equimini album? Oh, they don't forget. We were on set for a photo shoot, and Big Blue was like, man, what the age to pray him on? <laughs> <laughs> and it was just so funny, but like, it was really kind of a turning point in their career because it was cool because Big Boy was kind of like the hustler type, the dreams, the dreams and hat, and then Drake really just opened up his personality and kind of wasn't afraid to kind of go there and take it, you know, to the next level creatively. And it ended up working well. And, you know, it was like, Dre was like, oh, look, I don't need a fair use of you to Gemini. And that's how they came up, you know, with the women eye. And so it was like, oh, no, it's gonna be cool because I'm gonna kind of be far out and dress and do this. And it really worked. And so what I respected the most about Outcast is their level of creativity. And, you know, sometimes when you're in a record company situation, and I know you guys hear stories like, okay, the record company signs an artist, and we tell you you're going to look like this, and you're going to do this, and it's not always like that. L.A. Reid tried to give our artists the opportunity to be themselves and to express themselves. And so working with artists like TLC, who knew exactly what they wanted to look like, even though we had to hire a stylist, like Lisa would literally say, no, I want the skirt to go this way, or truly, my, I want my pants to look like this, and the drawstring here, and a lot of their stuff they would actually get tailor-made. And even Dre, he started getting his stuff tailor-made. So I just love when artists know who they are and they can really um, express that to the label and we can kind of all work together in terms of a collaborative effort. So they were just really creative artists. And they knew who they were and where their place was. Am I satisfied with where, uh, with what I've come to us from? Absolutely. Um, a little country girl from the A really came from much of nothing. My family didn't have a lot. You know, as I told you, you know, my father committed suicide and my mom had three kids and, you know, we pulled ourselves up, you know, and um, it's funny because I wasn't really spiritual, although I was, you know, I was Christian and, and I respected my religion. I grew up Catholic. Um, I would just kind of go to church and it was just kind of just a regular routine for me. But it wasn't until 2003 when I started going to a different non-denominational church, uh, and I, I am in no way trying to sway religious opinions, I'm just telling you about my journey. For me, my relationship with God kind of opened up once I got to New York, and once I was up 
there by myself, didn't have a lot of family members. And so being able to come from Atlanta from nothing and actually make it in New York City, I started understanding my accomplishments and being grateful for them and thankful for my blessings. And so I think that's what allowed me to continue going even further in New York City. I mean, I pretty much went from intern to executive vice president. That's the highest position you can go on the marketing side. And I just thank God every day for being able to accomplish that. And I, I worked with some of the most you know, successful artists you know, in the business. Um, I still have great relationships with some of them to this day. You know, you talk about traveling. I'll never forget, it was 1994, my second year at the Face Records, I mentioned, you know, growing up listening to, I mean, looking at American Dance and Soul Train. So back then, the Soul Train Awards were still popular, kind of before the BT Awards had started. L.A. came to my office, and he was like, taking some folks out from the company, would you want to go to Soul Train Awards? I'm like, what? Are you kidding me? I only grew up watching a new edition and all these artists on Soul Train. And no lie, this was, um, second year out of college go to LA, and it's not like that anymore, unfortunately, because labels aren't making as much as they used to. We got to the ball out in the 90s, and you can attest to that. John can attest to that. I go to LA, they let us rent business, and the first season. I mean, it was just, and some of the things that I, and it wasn't always just that, because I don't really pop or whatever, but you know, I'm human. I enjoy nice things. And so, I got a chance to like experience some really incredible moments in hip hop, even just going back to what I said. That was so significant being at the Source Awards when Outkast won and Dre got up there and said, The South got something to say. People, that's like something that's universal. Everybody knows about that moment. It was a breaking point for Southern hip hop. And I can say I was there. I can say that I threw Outkast a cookout the year before that, 1994, when they first went platinum. And I, nobody else in the company planned it. I had one person working under me that helped me with it. But I, we set up a stage. On that stage, I had Big Smalls, Puffy, Buster Rhymes, Usher, and Outkast. All before they all blew up. And I got to work with them. I was backstage at when Russell Simmons us take this show called The Show. I was there at that moment. I got a chance to go to every hot Diddy party there ever was. Like, what am I complaining about? Like, I've experienced on tour at Prince. Like, I mean, at the end of the day, I am so thankful and humble and appreciative of everything. And I wouldn't change, you know, the good, the bad, and the ugly. It was my experience that I went through, but it was a wonderful career for myself. But I just felt like Two years ago, it was time to do something different. For me, I still have you know friends that started the business and they're still in it. I just kind of wanted to get to know Shanti a little bit more and to spend more time with my family and, and still do entertainment, but just kind of like you know focus on some of the other stuff that mattered to me. In life. So the next five years, um, I don't know. I'm really enjoying this radio thing with Chris Webber. It's kind of cool. And uh, it, right now it's just doing basketball season. We're gonna pick back up in October. But you know, Chris says we want a good job, and you know we're actually it feels like we've known each other for years. Um, he's a good guy, and he has some other goals and stuff. So hopefully we'll be partnering and doing some things together. But quite honestly, I want to do more philanthropic type work. Um, I feel like also one of my callings now is to give back because I do a lot of mentoring. Um, I talk to a lot of students. I feel like God has blessed me and given me these wonderful experiences. Even if I don't experience one other thing, now I know one of my purposes in life now is to help and to try to get back and pull people up. So, like, I feed the homeless once a month. Um, I'm doing this event for the United Way called the Shoebox Project next week where we're putting together toiletries for women and children that are homeless. Two years ago, um, I started my own foundation called Maybe Rest in Peace. I was just one day I was at work and looking at cnnmoney.com and I saw this article about Detroit. And there were bodies stacked up in a morgue, not to torture a lot or anything. But I was like, this is weird. Like, these are people's family members that are just in the morgue and can't be buried. So I, the next day, I started my own foundation. I wrote this long, parked up letter to all my friends in the business. Kid Rock gave like 5000 Buster gave money, got Econ to give money. And we buried 30 people. I ain't nobody from Detroit. I ain't from Detroit. I mean, maybe I got a couple cousins on the outskirts, but but I just felt like it was the right thing to do. That I had, you know, I know all these great people, and I'm in this, you know, so, social circle and economic circle of influence, and that I wanted to use that for better good society. I feel all corny, but I really feel like that's part of my purpose now, my journey. So I hope to still dabble in you know in entertainment, maybe do more 
And so there are a lot of people now, my point is there are a lot of people actually who are doing that in India uh, on a daily basis, and they're actually designing ebooks and uploading the content for people. And it's a cheap way to do it. And obviously, I want to support my country, but I couldn't find any Americans <laughs> that were doing it for cheap. So my friend recommended someone in India, and they were able to do it. It's not that hard. So if you don't have a lot of capital and money up front, I would say go the ebook route first because everybody has a reader now, you know. Um, the only thing is, you know, with an ebook, you know, the price point is going to be lower. If you have an actual physical copy of it, copy of your book, you know, you can kind of go at, at somewhere of a higher price point. But an ebook is a good way to get started. It's not going to at all. Hey, I'm Kerry O'Boy. Hi. All right. Well, you talked about a lot of sacrifices we have to make in, in college. Um, but I remember watching Baby Boy how um, the movie? Yeah, the movie. How uh, Joe's mom used to always say, "Well, Mama gotta have a life too." Mm -hmm. So after you got older, and I know there's still a social aspect of life. Sure. So you're really, really busy with your company. But what did you have to compromise as an adult? Um, dating. Why would you? <laughs> <laughs> I never really dated much like I should. Um, I did some. First got to New York, I went out some and parties, but then I really just kind of like threw myself into my work and kind of let that part of my life go to some of it. So I do regret that a little bit because it's so boy one trying to find somebody to date <laughs> the lamb, but probably yeah, the social side. <laughs> and and see New York is such an incredible place and it has a lot to offer not only just on the entertainment side, but even on the cultural side. And I felt like wow, you know, it, it's sad that I have to go back now and go visit the vet. When I lived there, I'm like, uh, you know, it was here and I didn't get to go to any of these great exhibits or even just going out hanging out in Soho, you know, which is another I think it's really important to work hard and play hard. And so if I had to do things a little bit differently, I probably would have tried to incorporate more of a social life for myself. Because, you know, who knows when I'll get a chance to live in New York City again. And sometimes you're just, you know, it's like tunnel vision. It's like, okay, I gotta do this, I wanna be great, but other people out there enjoy themselves, and you know, you gotta know how to do it as well. The only thing I will say though, on a social note is, because we work in the entertainment business and it's such a social business, you gotta know people are always watching. And so you gotta always be on your, your P's and Q's. Because even if, say for example, it was after hours, some of my girlfriends who didn't work in the industry came and we went to an event, but there were some industry people there. Well, some people might be like, I ain't working. Like, whatever, I can do whatever. People are always watching. And so I still couldn't quite let my guard all the way down. And so, but that's important, because with one, with me being an executive, you know your reputation and everything that you have, and so some people care and some people don't, but that's why I would like to think that I'm still respected, because I try to carry myself in the right manner. And so that's just important. Just know that people are, especially in this age, God knows if we had cell phones, and took pictures back in the day, right? Some people would be in trouble. But um, I always just try to carry myself, you know, in the right way, and even when I was out socially, I just didn't too crazy because I just didn't want to come back and come be And I'm not judging people but you have a good time, you have a good time. But just be smart about it. Hi. Um based my name's Alicia, I'm a public relations manager. Um based off your experience of the hip hop industry in the nineties, how do you get out of the way hip hop has evolved I guess from the time? Um, in what way? In terms of the caliber of artists, um, how women have been objectified? Because you could go a couple different ways with that question. Um, I guess just, I don't know. What the or just the culture. Yeah, more of the culture. And I guess the kind of music that's out now, or the artists in general, and the of artists that today compared to like that time. Um, it's funny I asked Nas that question. <laughs> um, <laughs> I had to answer that. Um, I would say that. Do I listen to some of the hip hop music, you know, into the current day, present day, whatever? Yes. Um, do I think it's as good? I'm sorry, it ain't. In my opinion, and it's just my opinion. But the one thing, like, okay, you had Luke back in the day, but at the same time you had Run DMC, you, you had a Nas, you had a KRS one. I mean, it was such a balance in hip hop, and that's what I appreciate. You had a Queen of you had a DC Light. And then, you know, a couple of years later, you still had a little Kim who could do a raunchy thing. And I still was a little Kim fan to a certain degree. I didn't agree with everything. But I'm not a hypocrite, and I'm not for 
censorship, and so what I didn't listen to, I didn't listen to, and my mom taught me the difference between right and wrong. So I'm definitely not that chick that blames society, I mean, blames hip hop for all of society's problems. But I respected the fact that it was more of a balance, and that you had more conscious rap, you had stuff that was just in the clubs, you still had Too Short with the dirty, dirty stuff, you definitely probably don't repeat, but had high beats. It was just, but, but you know what I mean? It was more, I think we were more well rounded as a culture and just the type of artists that were being put out there. That's why I still find myself going back listening to like a Nas Illmatic, which was what I was saying in But that's classic material. I mean, it's just, you know, and I thank God, it's funny like that you asked me that question because I told Nas, I said, you know, there were, going back to the, the moments where I felt like I could say I was there, I was there in that moment in time in hip hop, like, one of the things I'm going home to do that I'm going to publish on my website, hopefully this weekend, is an open letter to God about how appreciative I am of all the moments that I experienced in music and just got to experience these icons, yeah, these iconic type artists. I just don't know 20 years later what's it going to be for y'all. Okay, Future's hot. I think Kanye is hot. I know, Drake is hot, but Drake to me, I have no, are you a rapper or you a singer? And I'm not dog, Drake is dope. But I'm just saying, like, like, who is my Nas today? You know, who is my Q you know, my Q tip, my Tribe Called Quest, my Dead My Soul? Like, you just had a plethora of artists that were all hot. I mean, the fact that I grew up with all of these artists, and oh my God, Biggie. I got to tour with Biggie, because you know, we were under the same umbrella, Arista Records, Bad Boys from Arista, and so was the face. I'll never forget, it's a club called Phoenix, Club Phoenix back in the day. Biggie was in town, and that's when he was really getting hot. It was the hottest show ever, and I was standing on the side of the stage. So, you know, I'm a social girl. Back then, I wore baggy clothes, you probably see from the book, Pats and Back Row. Big was letting me show on side stage, and his security guard, usually about 10 minutes before the show starts, they kind of sweep the stage. Everybody gotta go. Can't stay on stage. You gotta get out of here. So the security guard literally, like, picked me up, and then I rushed you, like, put her down. He's like, she can stand right here. Yo, Biggie let me, I'm the only person with me and Big. Like, I'm right here, Big. And he was so hot. And so, like, just those kind of experiences, I just don't know that they exist anymore. Like, those kind of moments where you say, oh my God, future, let me say right. Like, really? Is it the same with that? <laughs> <laughs> It's where it was, and it may take some time. 